Hello everybody and welcome to our module on renal tubular acidosis. In the video on metabolic acidosis, I talked about six causes of a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And the last of these six causes are the renal tubular acidoses, and that's what we're going to focus on in this module. Renal tubular acidosis disorders are rare disorders of nephron ion channels, and all of them cause a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And many of them present with low bicarbonate or abnormal potassium. This is often how they are detected, either on routine blood work that is abnormal or through symptoms from abnormal potassium. And just by way of review, I've written the hallmark features of a metabolic acidosis at the bottom of the screen. The pH is reduced below the normal range of 7.37 to 7.42, and the bicarbonate is low. Renal tubular acidoses are very easy to understand if you understand how the nephron reabsorbs bicarbonate and excretes acid. And by acid, I mean hydrogen ions or protons. The first thing the nephron does to maintain acid-base balance is reabsorb lots of bicarbonate in the proximal tubule. The second thing the nephron does is secrete hydrogen atoms into the lumen of the collecting duct. And in order for these hydrogen ions to go into the collecting duct lumen, aldosterone needs to work normally because one of the functions of the hormone aldosterone is to drive secretion of acid in the collecting duct. So there are three forms of renal tubular acidosis. The first one occurs if bicarbonate reabsorption does not happen in the proximal tubule. That will lead to an acidosis. The second one occurs if hydrogen ions are not pumped into the lumen of the collecting duct. That causes a renal tubular acidosis. And then finally, if the nephron cannot respond to aldosterone normally for any reason, that causes the third form of renal tubular acidosis. Let's start by talking about a type 2 renal tubular acidosis, also called a proximal renal tubular acidosis. And it gets its name because the primary problem in the nephron in a type 2 RTA is a defect in the proximal tubular bicarbonate reabsorption, just like I've indicated at the bottom of the screen. This leads to the loss of bicarbonate in the urine, and therefore it causes a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, just like all RTAs. And the key thing to know about the proximal RTAs is that they're relatively mild. They're often asymptomatic. And the reason for this is because the distal nephron can still secrete acid, and that makes up for a lot of the problem of losing bicarbonate in the urine. Therefore, these are typically milder RTAs. Patients with proximal RTAs develop hypokalemia. So why does this happen? Well, anytime the proximal tubule loses bicarbonate reabsorption, that leads to diuresis. The reason for this is because the proximal tubule reabsorbs sodium together with bicarbonate. So if it's not reabsorbing bicarbonate, it will also not reabsorb sodium. Sodium will go out in the urine and take water with it, and that will lead to diuresis. Because of the diuresis, there's contraction of the volume, and any time the volume in the body contracts, this activates the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Increased aldosterone leads to increased potassium excretion, and that leads to hypokalemia. The second important feature of a proximal RTA that you need to know is that the urine pH will be low, and less than 5.5 is a low pH. So why does this happen? Well, the distal tubule can still excrete protons in the setting of a type 2 RTA. And as more protons build up in the blood due to acidosis, this distal nephron starts putting lots of acid into the urine. This makes the urine acidic, and it makes the urine pH low. It also causes a negative urine anion gap. I'll talk more about this in a few slides. So like I told you before, proximal RTAs are usually relatively mild. If you look at the screen here, a normal bicarbonate is 24. In a proximal RTA, the bicarbonate will be about 12 to 20. And this is in stark contrast to distal RTAs, which we'll talk about in a minute. When the distal nephron can't secrete acid, the bicarbonate gets very low, often less than 10. Type 4 RTAs, which is the last type we'll talk about in this video, also are relatively mild in terms of the decrease in bicarbonate. Once again, the reason for the mild decrease in bicarbonate in proximal RTAs is because the distal intercalated cells function normally and they secrete acid to compensate for the acidosis. So here's a sample case. A patient has no symptoms and comes in for routine blood work, or maybe they have some mild weakness and that's because of low potassium. The blood work shows a reduced bicarbonate in the mild range of 12 to 20. There's hypokalemia and the urine pH is low. This is a type 2 proximal RTA profile. And the treatment is with sodium bicarbonate, which replenishes the bicarbonate being lost in the urine. There are two high yield associations with proximal RTAs that you should know for your step one exam. The first one is that a proximal RTA occurs as a component of Fanconi syndrome. Fanconi syndrome is a generalized failure of the proximal tubule, and people who have the Fanconi syndrome lose in the urine all the things that should be reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. 
This includes phosphate, glucose, amino acids, urate, protein, all these things spill into the urine. And in addition, people with the Fanconi syndrome develop a proximal RTA because their proximal tubule isn't working. Fanconi syndrome can be seen as an inherited disorder in children. It can also occur secondary to a number of drugs. Second high yield association is with multiple myeloma. Some forms of light chains that develop in multiple myeloma are toxic to the proximal tubule, and this can lead to Fanconi syndrome. And once again, anyone who has Fanconi syndrome can develop a type 2 or proximal RTA. In the renal video on diuretics, I talk about acetazolamide. It's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor that has a weak diuretic effect because it blocks sodium reabsorption. Well, the way that acetazolamide works is by essentially causing a proximal RTA. As I told you before, sodium gets reabsorbed along with bicarbonate in the proximal tubule. So when you shut down the reabsorption of bicarbonate, you shut down the reabsorption of sodium. This leads to a mild diuretic effect, and it causes a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis through increased elimination of bicarbonate. So the point I just want to make here is that a patient taking acetazolamide will develop the same clinical features as a patient with a proximal RTA. That's because the drug causes the defect associated with a type 2 proximal RTA. Moving on, now let's talk about our next renal tubular acidosis. That's the type 1 or distal renal tubular acidosis. The problem in this condition is that the distal nephron cannot secrete protons into the urine. In other words, the nephron cannot acidify the urine. This leads to a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, just like all the RTAs. Because there's less excretion of acid, it leads to acidemia, and whenever there's less excretion of acid in the distal nephron, there's less resorption of potassium, and therefore this leads to hypokalemia. In the distal nephron, when acid goes out into the lumen of the nephron, in other words, into the urine, potassium is reabsorbed. What this means is that if there's a defect in acidification of the urine, there will also be a defect in reabsorption of potassium, that leads to potassium going out in the urine and hypokalemia. Distal RTAs are famous for causing a very low bicarb. You may know that a normal bicarb is about 24, and in a distal RTA, it can get less than 10. The reason for this is because the way that the body excretes most of the daily acid load is by secreting it into the urine in the distal nephron. So when that's impaired, the body really loses its ability to get rid of acid and therefore a severe acidosis can occur. In addition, a classic finding of a distal RTA is for the urinary pH to be high. When the urine cannot be acidified by those cells in the distal collecting duct, the urine will therefore not develop a low pH and the urine will be alkaline. So the diagnosis of a distal RTA is established if you have a metabolic acidosis and an alkaline urine. Once you see those two things, this is the type of RTA you have. And an alkaline urine is considered a urine with a pH greater than 5.5. A classic symptom of a distal RTA is chronic and recurrent kidney stones. And it's high yield to know this because this will often be mentioned in a board question describing a patient with a type 1 RTA. When the urine becomes alkaline, it can precipitate stones. Sometimes they can even be bilateral. The acidosis also causes more calcium to be reabsorbed from bones, and acidosis suppresses calcium resorption in the kidneys. So this leads to more calcium coming from bones, more calcium staying in the urine, and this leads to a setup for developing kidney stones. In addition, the calcium loss can lead to rickets in children, and children can have growth failure if they have an undiagnosed and untreated type 1 or distal RTA. There are many etiologies of a distal RTA, but you should know that a classic association of type 1 RTA is with autoimmune diseases, especially Sjogren's syndrome or rheumatoid arthritis. Any board question describing a patient with one of these conditions who develops a metabolic acidosis, you should think of a distal RTA. In addition, there are medications associated with this condition. Amphotericin B is an antifungal drug that is a classic cause of a distal RTA. And then there are rare genetic forms that you can see in children. Let's talk about the urine anion gap. This is a measurement you can make in patients with metabolic acidosis that can be helpful in determining the cause. In particular, it can be helpful for making the diagnosis of a distal RTA. So the urine anion gap is an evaluation of urine acid excretion. When you have an acidosis, lots of ammonium is excreted and the ammonium carries hydrogen ions with it. So that's why ammonium helps you to excrete acid from the body. Problem is very few labs can measure ammonium directly. It's difficult to do this. So instead what they measure is the urine anion gap. The urine anion gap is the urinary sodium plus the potassium minus the chloride, just like I've shown you at the bottom of the screen. When patients are excreting lots of ammonium, that leaves in the urine with chloride. So this chloride number is going to get very high. 
That's going to make the urine anion gap negative when lots of acid is being excreted. So any patient who has an acidosis and has normal kidneys that are working, the urine anion gap should be negative. That's the normal state, the normal finding you should have in a patient with an acidosis. So for example, let's imagine a patient has a gastrointestinal metabolic acidosis, such as you see from diarrhea. This is going to cause the urinary anion gap to become negative. The reason for this is because in a GI cause of a metabolic acidosis, the kidneys are working normally. That means ammonium excretion is going to go up and therefore urinary chloride is going to go up. And by this equation, when urinary chloride goes up, the urine anion gap will become negative. And the way everyone remembers this, including many renal attendings I know, is through the mnemonic negative in GI causes of metabolic acidosis. You can also sometimes see a negative urinary anion gap in a proximal type 2 RTA, just like we talked about earlier. That's because in this type of RTA, the distal acid secretion of the nephron is intact. Therefore, the urinary chloride concentration can go up and the urine anion gap can become negative. In a distal RTA or in a type 4 RTA, which we're going to talk about in a minute, in those two conditions, the urine anion gap is positive, And that's why this test can be helpful for working on your differential diagnosis. The reason it's positive is because the kidneys can't excrete protons normally. Therefore, ammonium doesn't go up normally and chloride doesn't go up normally. And the urine anion gap does not become negative like it should. So in a type 1 or distal RTA or in a type 4, those are the two renal tubular acidoses where the urine anion gap becomes positive. Remember, a positive urine anion gap in the setting of an acidosis is abnormal. That's not the way the kidneys work. And when you see that, it means there's something wrong with the secretion of protons and ammonium in the distal nephron. There's another special test that can be sometimes used to make a diagnosis of a type 1 distal RTA, and that's called an ammonium chloride challenge. This is a picture of ammonium chloride on the screen here. It's a white powder. And what you can do is administer this to a patient who has an acidosis. This is called challenging them with ammonium chloride. This basically gives an acid load to the body because ammonium chloride is an acid. And the urinary pH should become low after they ingest ammonium chloride. However, in patients with a distal RTA, the urine pH will remain high, greater than 5.3. And once again, that's because of the defect in secretion of protons in the distal nephron that you see in type 1 RTA. So the classic case of a type 1 distal RTA is a patient with Sjogren's syndrome or maybe a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis. There's a history of bilateral recurrent kidney stones. The bicarb is going to be very low on blood work, often less than 10. There'll also be hypokalemia and then the high urinary pH. Once you see this, the answer is almost always a distal RTA. The urine anion gap will be positive, which is abnormal. It should be negative in an acidosis. And if you challenge them with ammonia chloride, you will find a high urinary pH. And the treatment is with sodium bicarbonate. This basically gives base or alkaline back to the body to counteract the acidosis. We'll finish by discussing the third type of renal tubular acidosis. That's a type 4 RTA. And a type 4 RTA is basically the clinical picture that arises when you have hypoaldosteronism. If there are decreased effects of the hormone aldosterone, for whatever reason, that's going to lead to the acid-based disturbance that we're going to talk about now called a type 4 RTA. So in a type 4 RTA, the distal tubule fails to respond to aldosterone, as I've indicated at the bottom of the screen here. This can be either because there's deficient levels of aldosterone in the body or because of aldosterone resistance, and we'll talk more about this in a minute. So when there is decreased activity of aldosterone, there's less excretion of potassium, and that leads to hyperkalemia. And I've bolded this because this is a unique feature of a type 4 RTA. This is the only RTA associated with high potassium. In addition, aldosterone promotes the secretion of acid in the distal nephron. So when aldosterone activity is deficient, there will be a mild non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Usually the bicarb is greater than 17, normal is 24. You don't get those very low bicarbs like less than 10 we talked about for a distal RTA. The major pathologic defect in the nephron in a type 4 RTA is decreased ammonium excretion, and it's super high yield to know this. This is what they're going to want you to understand about a type 4 RTA for step one. So normally, ammonia is a urinary buffer. So when you lose ammonia in the urine, that leads to a low urinary pH, and that's what you see in a type 4 RTA, a low urinary pH less than 5.3. Normally, the proximal tubule synthesizes ammonia, which is NH3, and ammonia can pick up a proton to become NH4. And for this reason, ammonia is a buffer. It can pull protons out of solution and prevent the pH from dropping as low as it might drop if you didn't have the buffer ammonia present. So when ammonia production decreases in a type 4 RTA, 
this is going to cause loss of urinary buffering and as a result there are going to be lots of protons in solution and there's going to be a decrease in the urinary pH, one of the hallmark features of a type 4 RTA. And the reason there's less ammonia production and less ammonium excretion all ties back to hyperkalemia. When you have hyperkalemia from aldosterone deficiency or deficiency of aldosterone effects, this suppresses ammonium excretion. It does this through a couple of mechanisms. It blunts the proximal tubule's ability to synthesize ammonia. It also blunts ammonia secretion into the distal nephron, but through whatever mechanism, you get what I've shown here on the screen. The hyperkalemia inhibits the secretion of ammonium in the urine, and that is going to cause loss of urinary buffering and a low pH. So I told you before that patients with hypoaldosteronism develop a type 4 RTA. So what are some of the common reasons that patients develop hypoaldosteronism? Well, it turns out the most common reason is what's known as hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism. This means that there is low renin activity and that that secondarily causes decreased aldosterone production. Remember that renin and aldosterone are part of the RAS, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So if renin activity declines, aldosterone production is going to decline. Some of the common reasons this happens are, first of all, diabetes, super high yield to know this. Patients who have diabetes develop low renin production for reasons that are poorly understood. This can lead to a type 4 RTA. So in a board question, this will be a diabetic who comes in with elevated potassium and low bicarb and low urine pH. That patient has a type 4 RTA. NSAIDs are also known to impair renin release, so patients taking lots of NSAIDs can develop a type 4 RTA. And then there are a number of other drugs. You can read about these, but they're all associated with type 4 RTA, meaning that they lead to hyperkalemia and low serum bicarb. Patients taking drugs that interfere with the RAS can also develop low aldosterone levels in a type 4 RTA. So in other videos, I talk about ACE inhibitors and ARBs and direct renin inhibitors like liscarin. All of these drugs, as you may know, are associated with hyperkalemia. They can all cause high potassium by blunting aldosterone effects. Well, what you need to know now is that they can also cause a reduced serum bicarb level, and they can also cause the urinary pH to get low. This all has to do with the other features that fall out from the high potassium level associated with low aldosterone. That leads to the acid-base disturbance of a type 4 RTA. You can also develop a type 4 RTA if for any reason the nephron becomes resistant to aldosterone. This is usually caused by drugs that inhibit tubular function. Classic drugs to do this are potassium-sparing diuretics and Bactrim. With potassium-sparing diuretics, the goal is to block aldosterone effects, so naturally, they are going to cause a high potassium level, and they are also going to cause a mild metabolic acidosis, as we've been describing for a type 4 RTA. Bactrim can also have a similar effect. So the classic case is going to be a diabetic with mild renal insufficiency. Most cases of type 4 RTA occur among these types of patients. Because of the renal insufficiency, they make a little bit less renin than normal. In addition, diabetes causes less renin production, and that leads to hyporenonemic hypoaldosteronism. So a patient like this who presents with unexplained hyperkalemia and a low serum bicarb probably has a type 4 RTA. And you can treat this form of RTA with fludrocortisone. Fludrocortisone is a mineralocorticoid. If you look at the bottom of the screen, it has a structure very similar to aldosterone. So you can give this as an oral drug and it can bring the potassium down and improve the acidosis. I'll finish with this slide summarizing the three forms of renal tubular acidosis. In a type 1 RTA, this involves the distal nephron. The urinary pH is high, a very unusual finding in acidosis. These patients develop kidney stones and they develop very low bicarb, usually less than 10. In a type 2 RTA, this involves the proximal tubule. This is a milder acidosis and it often occurs as a component of Fanconi syndrome. Remember that multiple myeloma is a classic cause of a type 2 RTA. And type 4, we just finished talking about. This involves hypoaldosteronism, hyperkalemia, and abnormalities of ammonium excretion. And then in the bottom slide, I've summarized the plasma, potassium, and urinary findings in the different RTAs. Type 1 and 2 are associated with hypokalemia. Only type 4 is associated with hyperkalemia. The urinary pH is going to be low in types 2 and 4. It's going to be high only in type 1. And that concludes our video on renal tubular acidosis.